Hey, welcome to Crossroads. Folks, the day is upon us. We now have a social credit system right here in the United States that has been installed quietly, interestingly, not by the government, but instead by private businesses and banks. Let me explain. Now, Americans have been quietly assigned scores on this. It's in similar ways, really, to the way the Chinese Communist Party's social credit system works. Remember, under the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP has a system that monitors every single individual, gives every single individual a score, and your score on this digital system they have determines your freedom or your oppression within the communist system. And so, for example, the people you're around, if your friend believes in democracy or if your uh, girlfriend's a Christian or something like that, these things can affect you indirectly. And it's through this the CCP uh, creates a type of incentive system to enact the communist uh, policies through individuals. Now, the system outside of China, right here in the United States, the still in the works, is working through private businesses and banks. And rather than use a CCP standard of adherence to the ruling regime, it's instead based on the social justice standards under ESG, or environmental and social governance. You have ESG scores rather than a social credit score. Already, apparently, purchasing a gun, buying alcohol, or other items can affect your personal ESG score. And the scores allegedly also take into account which vendors you choose to buy products from. For example, a certain demonized pillow guy um, you know, <laughs> might, might, get you, might get you docked a few points, uh, unfortunately. Now, it says here, this is the impact investor explaining it. It says a personal ESG score, your ESG score, evaluates an individual's performance and impact based on three main factors, environmental, social, and governance, ESG. As ESG criteria assesses businesses, sustainability, and ethics, a personal ESG score, just like the big corporate ones, offers insight into a person's commitment to sustainable practices, and apparently we're all committed to this whether we like it or not. It says, and it also looks into responsible decision making, responsible by whose standards and sustainable by whose standards as well, I would ask. Uh, because frankly, I'd say that when they say responsible and Social justice, you know, it, it has other implications depending on who's saying it. But back to this, it says the purpose behind personal ESG scores involves promoting more mindful behaviors towards the environment and society. By holding individuals accountable for their actions, these scores encourage better choices and habits, meaning, of course, better choices in line with what is deemed to be a better choice by a corporation or a big bank. Uh, when they're trying to make you adhere to their ridiculous standards. But regardless of that, it says that these better choices and habits are then lead to positive change on a larger scale. They're trying to enact broader social policies by giving you scores and trying to incentivize you or punish you uh, based on your decisions. It notes that since this is still a relatively new concept, the current level of transparency is a bit murky. In many cases, people are generally unaware that they even have an ESG score. And some examples of this, they say. For example, customers, uh, consumers who have accounts with Merrill Lynch, they claim, will be able to view their score, whatever that may be. Lenders will use this system to choose who they extend services or credit to, meaning that if you have a bad score, well, you might not get that service you're looking for. It says the main reason is that companies, including lenders, are grading are graded according to the ESG standards and apparently that now extends even to you as the clients potentially now further in it says this to assess your personal ESG score you can turn to various rating agencies and tools that specialize in evaluating individual environmental social and government risks and impacts these entities focus on offering comprehensive insights into your ESG related activities credit reports, and public records. Further in, it says that during the assessment process, your personal ESG score is calculated based on three main factors, environmental, social, and governance, which includes, for example, it says, 
your purchase history, what products are you choosing to buy, your sales history, your public records, including, as you've such, your credit reports. All of these are considered to gauge your impact on the environment and society. And let me show you some clear examples of this. On the environmental front, it says, this aspect examines your carbon footprint, energy consumption, and waste management practices. On the social front, it is your charitable contributions, uh, which we'd assume would dock you points if it's to charities they do not approve of. It includes your community engagements, which we would assume also includes only the things that they approve of. And employment practices are all assessed right here. And under governance, it says this component considers your ethical behavior, decision-making, transparency, and regulation adherence. So that's the one very much like what the CCP has, how closely you follow the party line. <laughs> Folks, we're here. We're here. This is, this is what we've been warning about, and it's right here. Uh, James Lindsay, we've had him on the show before. You know, he wrote a book, of course, book called Cynical Theories. Uh, very interesting guy. He had something interesting to say on Twitter, or X. He's been raising awareness over this issue as well, and here's what he had to say. He said, paying attention yet? Personal ESG scores are a social credit system of tyranny based on ESG fraud and arbitrary power. Buying a gun or alcohol or even clothing will affect your overall ESG score. Not only will, you, will your purchases matter, but who you purchase from. <sighs> Anyways, I want to show you what this actually means in practice, then we'll go a bit more into how it's being applied. So, I mean, you might be asking, I mean, you know, what, is it, what does it actually mean in the details, right? We talked about the big picture. This is back to the impact investor explaining some of that. And notes that environmental factors, your personal ESG score starts with environmental factors. It says these factors illustrate how your actions contribute to climate change and environmental degradation. A major aspect to consider is your company's carbon emissions and footprint, which encompasses your energy consumption habits, your transportation choices and consumption of goods with high environmental impact, such as meat or fossil fuels. It says you can work on reducing your carbon footprint by using energy efficient appliances and light bulbs, incorporating renewable energy sources into your home, purchasing locally produced sustainable goods, opting for public transportation, or using electric or hybrid vehicles. <laughs> Folks, digging into that. Remember, we've been talking about this whole global agreement by governors and mayors around the world, right? And one of the things they're pushing for, as we've been discussing on the show, I've shown you their documents, they want to start phasing out consumption of meat. They don't want people eating meat. They also believe that you should only be able to buy a few sets of clothes every year. They also want to start limiting your options when you go to buy products. They want to have vendors creating fewer products to limit the number of options to make buying stuff a more simplified process. They want to squeeze the markets. They want to eliminate certain products from the markets. And they are enacting this already through various incentives and punishments. Uh, part of this can be, for example, like we've seen uh, things financing the electric car industry. And Biden recently, as you know, signed an executive order on this, uh, beginning to make it more difficult to buy a gas-powered vehicle and limiting the supply of them. Uh, they're trying to force people to buy electric cars when obviously people don't want them. They're like rotting at the fact. They're, they're like rotting in the car lots, basically, you know, decaying into, into piles of scrap, essentially. But because people don't want these things, they found that they have to try to force people to want these things, which is what this is about. Now, it's not only just the adherence to the, you know, woke god of, you know, worshipping the environment or whatever the heck they're doing, right? Uh, the bowing down to the Greta Thornburgs of the world like they want you to do in some places. It's not just that. It's also other things which include even social factors. Under social factors, it says this, that these play an essential role in your personal ESG score. This category evaluates how you contribute to societal well-being through your actions, behavior, and choices. And you might be thinking, well, I'm a good moral person. I believe in God. 
Uh, I have high moral standards and there's things I, I disapprove of and there's things I approve of because I have a system of morality that recognizes good and evil. Well, it doesn't work here because what they're actually talking about with this is not true morality. They're not talking about traditional morality. They're talking about government mandated and regulated morality or the morality through the Klaus Schwab's and Bill Gates of the world. This includes their standards on so-called diversity, equity, and inclusion. And these include, for example, under diversity, that you have to, it says, if you want a good ESG score, embrace and support diversity in your personal and professional relationships. On human rights, it says, be aware of your impact on the well-being of others and seek to promote human rights through responsible consumer choices, like, bu like buying fair trade products and participating in charitable activities. Uh, meaning, of course, that if you join the wrong charitable activities, they'll probably punish you for it. Uh, whereas if you go and maybe march with Antifa or something like that, maybe they'll give you a nice pat on the back. Under community engagement, it says this. Get involved in local initiatives geared towards improving the quality of life in your community, such as volunteering, supporting local businesses, or attending public meetings. Maybe they're talking about you know, in southern Manhattan, they have a new takeover where they've, they've established this new, like, woke site where all these people claim to have conquered a public park, uh, very much like the Chaz or Chop site that was in Seattle. Uh, maybe that's what they're talking about. I don't actually know. But we would assume, of course, that it has to be in line with DEI and ESG, uh, meaning, of course, that this is a politically biased standard used to assign people certain scores, and those scores are then used to assign them, let's say, access or denial of services. And under governance, it says this, it's governance factors, and it says, finally, governance factors are crucial components to your personal ESG score, and it says they involve assessing your commitment to ethical practices, transparency, and fairness in your personal and professional life. Consider the following aspects to improve your governance score. Decision-making, practice, deliberate and transparent decision-making processes in both your personal and professional settings. Ethical behavior. Maintain integrity and honesty in all your actions. Avoid conflicts of interest and embracing accountability. And compliance, the big one here. Adherence to relevant laws, regulations, and industry standards. And that's the big one, right? Because you think, well, I'm a law-abiding citizen. I, do, I, I don't violate the law. I don't rob places, at least maybe not up to $900 like you would in California, uh, that maybe you don't do drugs on the streets unless you're in New York where they've legalized it. You know, you're a law-abiding citizen. You follow the regulations. But also, it's industry standards. So you're not just following the law of the government. You're following the laws of these woke corporations and woke banks industry standards what does that mean what kind of standards are the industries promoting maybe it's like disney and their esg standards maybe it's like some of these big corporations that were telling their employees literally to be less white uh, maybe that will violate the industry standards if you choose to not support those things and it says that these standards govern your personal and professional activities look folks that was a guide from an investment website on the issue of personal ESG scores. And of course, you may also have banks already denying people services based on so-called social morality. And you know, quick on the topic of morality, folks, I'm not sure if you're all aware on another note, but Epic Times has a magazine called American Essence, which is dedicated to capturing why America is the leader of the free world, our traditional morals, and the values that underpin the United States of America traditionally and not these crazy, woke, insane ideas that people are promoting right now. The magazine we have is Amazing Stories with Features with American heroes, business investors, innovators, cultural leaders, you can see it here. The people who exemplify why America is great, like Mike Rowe, for example, a uh, great guy, by the way. Uh, like, for example, we have your Kirk Cameron, um, you know, we also had on Dennis Quaid. Uh, it's a great magazine. By the way, my wife is actually the chief editor, so I can personally endorse it. And there's even lifestyle and outdoor content and columns on things like why I love America, which I do. 
family roots and also you know, showcases on the finest parts of the United States. Now folks, again, I highly recommend it. If you haven't checked out American Essence yet, again, personal interest, my wife is the chief editor and I can personally endorse it because I know the kind of work she does. Uh, it is a fantastic magazine published by the Epic Times. And so if you haven't read it yet, go check it out. Again, it's called American Essence. American Essence, folks. Uh, you can find more, by the way, about it at the magazine's link. That's ept.ms forward slash American Essence. But now back to the stories. Now, folks, we've been talking about all the crazy things they're trying to force in us from on up high. And I would say this all goes against American values. Uh, because when is it that we've elected? Right, so when have you gone and voted to allow the banks to assign you a social governance score? When, when did you do that? When did you go and elect your workplace to be able to punish you or award you based on these things? Uh, when did you go and elect these big businesses and corporate shills working together with this giant infrastructure to begin establishing standards to try to govern you? that you have to follow industry standards, not just the laws of your country. When did you elect these people? Well, if you're like me, you never did. You never voted for them. You never elected them, which means that they are unelected tyrants. And these tyrants are now trying to force upon us their own standards, which in many cases are sickening. Uh, these are twisted, wo just woke, warped individuals trying to force things on people that they otherwise don't want, otherwise it would happen naturally. Now look, as we've been talking about, there are personal ESG scores, and these are systems very much like what you have under communist China. It's actually being put into practice right now by banks. And this ties into a practice currently in place called debanking. Let me show you a couple examples of this. Fox News said that nearly two dozen Republican state attorney generals signed a public letter addressed to two major voting uh, advisory firms asking them to treat all shareholders fairly and stop supporting their purported efforts to debank conservative clients. It says it led by uh, uh, Iowa AG Brenna Byrd. The letter sent this week to Glass, Lewis & Co. and Institutional Shareholder Services, Inc., Proxy services provide recommendations to shareholders regarding corporate governance matters such as ESG and voting decisions. Express deep concern that the pair are prioritizing certain environmental, social, and government initiatives that allegedly violate their contracts. In other words, these groups, because remember, we're talking about these personal ESG scores, and one of the ways it's being applied mainly is against people who are you know, working through investment firms if you're trying to get into Wall Street, these types of things. And these certain companies are looking at people's ESG personal scores as ways of deciding, taking into account whether they want to work with them or not. That's one of the initial ways this is being done. But we even find something else, which is they're even debanking people. They're taking away their bank accounts. They continued saying this, quote, unfortunately, all available evidence shows that you oppose those resolutions contrary to your claims to be apolitical and neutral, according to the letter to these individuals. It says banks will cite hate speech or reputational risk as reasons to debank organizations or individuals. And I would question, folks, what constitutes hate speech? How do we define hate speech? Personally, if I'm in a business and they harass me for the color of my skin, I'd call that hate speech. And I would say that includes if they harass you for being white. I would say that hate speech should include, for example, if a business tries to tell you that they have DEI hiring practices and they want to hire more diverse individuals and that does not include you because of the color of your skin. I would say that that is discrimination. I would say that is disgusting behavior but it's something ironically being done under the labels of these things. Oftentimes what these labels actually represent is the very thing that they claim to oppose. I would say that the DEI people are some of the most woke and racist people on the face of the planet. I would say that they violate the very standards they claim to be going against because at its root, the entire thing works through racial discrimination, religious discrimination, and otherwise. Uh, racial in terms of mainly going against white people and even Asians in some regards. And 
again, religious discrimination because they try to force people to adhere to certain moral standards. Uh, for example, trying to force people to acknowledge the you know, sodomites of the LGBTQ whatever movement. Uh, if you are a religious person, even if you don't dislike the individuals, you likely have moral standards that make you support or not support certain behaviors. It does not mean that you hate people. It just means that you have standards of morality you hold yourself to. And by nature of that, you recognize that some behaviors are not healthy. That is the basis of the moral standards of religion. And if the government's trying to tell you that you're not allowed to have moral standards, that the very act of having a moral standard is an act of discriminating against somebody else, even if you don't hate that individual or look down on them, just you have a standard of morals that makes you recognize what they're doing is not good, then they go after you for it. I would call that religious discrimination. And so I would say that by the very act of what these people are doing, they are doing the very thing that they claim to oppose. And, of course, now you're being punished for not following these standards. It notes, for example, that they take hate speech, reputational risks as reasons to debank not just organizations, but also individual people, meaning people like you and people like myself. It says that ISS and Glass-Lewis reportedly recommended voting against resolutions aiming to hold corporations accountable for these policies, the letter states, meaning, of course, they're even trying to interfere with voting standards and so on, what you vote for. Now, look, some of this is even being promoted by government agencies. It's not just businesses and it's not just banks. There's even government agencies involved in trying to enforce these things. You can take, for example, the Treasury Department's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network is doing right now as we speak. Just the News said this. The Treasury Department of our own government, their Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, it says, sees little difference between cryptocurrency transactions that may be tied to Hamas and banking services for U.S. groups that advocate for religious liberty, immigration restrictions, and a watchful waiting approach to pediatric gender confusion. In other words, folks, if you're giving money, again, donations or whatever else, to a terrorist group, and I would say that that should be kind of illegal, <laughs> I think it is, that some of these organizations within our own government don't see that as being different from you donating to groups that advocate for religious liberty. And frankly, I'd say this is sick government interference with people's religious beliefs. If you donate to things that work for immigration restrictions, maybe you oppose mass illegal migration. And if you're against the watchful waiting approach to pediatric gender confusion, meaning you don't like the fact that they're like castrating little girls and little boys and telling them that Sally's a, Sally's a bill or something like that. If you go against those things, they regard you in similar ways as if you were donating to a terrorist organization. It notes that that's the impression from FinCEN's email to large banks and financial institutions, again, because the banks are one of the big things tied in with this, it says that includes Western Union and PayPal, urging them to review a, quote, hate group report and, quote, hate symbol database by progressive activists, these woke madmen and insane people who've weaseled their way into our government. In the context, it says, of the January 6, 2021 Capitol riot, the great walkthrough of the Capitol building, uh, whereby individuals were trapped and framed and are prosecuted in ways that law has never been used before. Further, it says that the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, and National Counterterrorism Center, folks, keep that in mind. This is not just banks and stuff. It's the FBI. It's the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, a thing started under, under George Bush to try to prevent us from real terrorism, and also the National Counterterrorism Center shared an intelligence report with banks in the days after the riot, Jan 6, that warned Americans who, quote, expressed opposition to firearms regulations, like myself, I oppose firearm regulations, people who oppose, quote, open borders, which I oppose, uh, people who oppose COVID-19 lockdowns, which I oppose, people who oppose vaccine mandates, which I oppose, and the, quote, deep state, which I also frankly oppose, may qualify as domestic violent extremists. That's how DHS, FBI, and the Counterterrorism Center 
are defining, apparently, people who show risks of being domestic violent extremists. Folks, let me ask you, how many of you believe in the Second Amendment? How many of you believe the government should not be stealing your firearms or trying to restrict you from owning guns? And I would make a point, even people who want to get rid of them don't want to get rid of all of them. They just want to make sure that you as individuals don't have it, and only people approved by the government do have them. Because, frankly, they're not going to get rid of all of them. They still want to have police with guns. They still want to have military with guns. They still want to have their own personal bodyguards with guns, but they don't want you having them because somehow those people are born as different categories of human beings than you, and their judgment somehow is different from you. That's what they think, right? How many of you oppose open borders? How many of you are against just the raiding of the United States by literally like seven to nine million people uh, under Joe Biden alone? How many of you uh, are against the COVID-19 lockdowns, locking people in their homes for that? Uh, how many were against the vaccine mandates, making it so that you do not have bodily autonomy? The government can mandate a vaccine. You have to take it no matter what it is, no matter whether you think it's safe or not, no matter whether you think it may kill you, no matter anything. You just have to take it because the government says so. And how many of you dislike the idea of a deep state? Well, bad news. If you, if you oppose any of those things, according to this, you may qualify as, quote, domestic violent extremists. And this is according to their actual staff report. And don't forget, by the way, what happened with PayPal back in 2022, because remember they talked about this. I'll be talking more about this, though, after a quick word from our sponsor. And for those of you on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Rumble, don't go anywhere. We're going to do the full episode today. So again, if you want to leave questions, come join us on the live chat, though, on Epic TV. But don't forget, don't go anywhere. Uh, we also have the Easter sale going on, which is just $1 for six months. So if you want to come over to Epic TV, epochtv.com, link in the description. Again, $1 for six months. But again, we'll be doing the whole show today, so stick around. We'll be back soon. Experts agree. One of the best ways to protect against financial uncertainty is to diversify your portfolio. Learn how physical gold and silver can secure your retirement funds from today's economic challenges with a gold IRA from American Hartford Gold. You can safeguard your wealth with no penalties or taxes when you transfer your current qualifying retirement accounts. Call now and our precious metals specialists will send you a free information kit, no cost or obligation. American Hartford Gold, a trusted industry leader with an A-plus from the Better Business Bureau, has a five-star rating from thousands of happy clients. Whether you are getting physical precious metals in a gold IRA or delivered to your doorstep, we offer only the highest quality gold and silver. For your peace of mind, we also offer a no-fee buyback commitment, a low-price guarantee, along with free shipping and free insurance. So don't wait. Call the number on your screen today and secure your financial future. Welcome back. You might remember the drama around PayPal back in 2022, because this is important. We've been discussing how banks, financial institutions, even government agencies are trying to enforce new standards, not on the law, but instead on your personal beliefs, your personal behavior in terms of buying products and so on. And again, punishing you based on this data. Now, back to PayPal, you might remember the company was rolling out a policy that would have allegedly, according to them at the time at least, they wanted to fine users, charge you $2,500 for spreading misinformation. And when they were criticized for this, and they were pretty widely, PayPal backed off of that immediately. Let me show you what happened back then, folks. This is October of 2022. Daily Wire said, a new policy update from PayPal will, per will permit the firm to sanction users who advance purported misinformation or present risks to user well-being. What does that even mean? With fines of up to $2,500 per offense. The financial services company PayPal notes, which has repeatedly deplatformed organizations, speaking of which, and individual commentators for their political views, meaning they're already doing this, will expand its existing list of prohibited activities on November 3rd. It says among the changes are the prohibitions on the sending, posting, or publication of any messages, content, or materials that, quote, promote misinformation or, quote, 
present a risk to user safety or well-being. It says users are also barred from the, quote, promotion of hate, violence, racial, or other forms of intolerance that is discriminatory. Sounds a whole lot like ESG to me, folks. It says as well, the policy applies to actions taking, uh, taken using PayPal's platform. Deliberations will be made at the, quote, sole discretion of PayPal, meaning they're the ones who determine what is hateful and what is offensive and so on and may subject the user to, quote, damages, including the removal of $2,500 debited directly from your PayPal account per offense. It says the company's user agreement contains a provision in which account holders acknowledge that the figure is, quote, presently a reasonable minimum estimate of PayPal's actual damages due to the administrative cost of tracking violations and damage to the company's reputation. And remember those keywords, damaging to the company's reputation, because that's the same thing that the big banks and investment firms and so on are saying as well, that they're not just deplatforming you because they oppose what you say or what you do. They're deplatforming you because you damage the reputation of the business. And I question, how do you damage the reputation of the business? Uh, maybe it's because they work hand in glove with the woke media with these you know, corporate news outlets, ironically backed by many of the same parent corporations as these guys, and of course, maybe even tied in with some of their investments that will attack people if they say things you're not supposed to say. Uh, the glorified thought police masquerading as free media uh, that you find operating in the houses of most of the big corporate media. Now, I should note on PayPal, they backed off almost immediately because the backlash against them for these ridiculous standards uh, were frankly so disturbing to most people. Um, I personally went and canceled every part of PayPal I possibly could as soon as I saw this uh, because I do not support a company that would do such a thing. I personally went into my PayPal accounts and tried canceling everything. Uh, I got rid of them as much as I could. and Notably, they wouldn't let me quit all of them. That says that they claimed it was just an error. Just an error. We didn't mean to say that. It just went out in our official announcements, but it was an error, right? But unfortunately for them, the damage was already done because people saw through the nonsense and they do not want to support a company that does such things. How is it that you get a digital payment company and they find that they have the right to try to police your speech, to try to police what you can or can't say or can or can't buy? Who are they to decide? And of course, that's also one of the big things people are looking at when it comes to digital currencies. Because if we adopt CBDCs, centralized bank digital currencies, run not by government, right, which is, of course, has to adhere to the Constitution and its protections on free speech, but run instead through banks and people like this, what does that mean? It means that they can enforce laws and enforce standards that are not constitutionally protected because they are private businesses that do not have to adhere to those things. And so one of the ways that this big corporate you know, megalith system has found that they can go after individuals and enforce, frankly, communist or socialist ideologies on people and destroy family values and destroy morality and do these sick, twisted things that they say is about tolerance and whatever else, whatever labels they choose to slap on top of it. As they do that, they're able to police you and, in my opinion, even violate the Constitution because, again, they're private businesses and not government. And I think this raises a big question of whether, frankly, we should continue allowing these, these groups and companies and so on to be able to manage money and manage accounts and even work with, for example, Federal Reserve and otherwise, working with pseudo agencies given government power to an extent, the ability to print our money. Uh, the Federal Reserve, by the way, is neither federal nor, reser nor a reserve. Uh, it, it was created by a, a little group at the... Uh, the Jekyll Island, by the way, uh, shortly after the sinking of the Titanic, on which people who opposed it died, um, and of course enabled them to pass it, thereby establishing a banking cartel in the United States that is able to allow for very risky investment and then just bail out the banks using our money uh, through the form of actual inflation, right? That corrupt cartel, and I, I would call it a cartel, right, the banking cartel, was able to do these things because the government gave them the right to print our money, uh, to, again, print tender, 
and to make that the standard of currency for this country. And because they've been given that power, they then work with these other banks who, again, they can bail out if they go bankrupt or make really stupid investment choices. Uh, they can do very risky things and not face the consequences of their decisions. They are immune to bad business practices, in other words, and so they can do things that are not, let's say, of sound business, like trying to govern people's moral standards, like trying to enforce laws and socialist standards on the American people in ways that go against the protections in our Constitution. Because again, they're trying to play the role of government without actually being elected officials or being part of the government. They are trying to become pseudo-governing entities through the powers that have been granted to them through this banking cartel of the Federal Reserve. Now look, as well, this ties into a broader trend. It ties deeply with cancel culture as well, deeply in with censorship and other ways to keep people within the boundaries of political talking points. And notably, within the lines of what is deemed politically correct, uh, which I should note, political correctness comes from communist China. It was around 1967 under Mao Zedong, the former chairman of the CCP. And the nature of political correctness was this. It is a moral standard devoted to government action. It's been explained to me before, why does the Chinese Communist Party persecute religions? Uh, why were they murdering Christians and murdering Buddhists and murdering Taoists? Why do they continue to murder these people? Why do they harvest the organs from living Falun Gong practitioners and then sell these on the market? Why do they do such things? It's because for the CCP, they cannot tolerate the concept of people believing in a higher power. Because when you believe in God, it means you believe in a system of values that government has to adhere to, and government is no longer the arbiter of what is right and what is wrong. You can look at government action and say, I disagree with this, I believe it is evil. And of course, you can adhere to the standards of your religion, rooted in traditional values. The communist system understood that they could not truly control the world or control individuals as long as religion exists. And so under every communist and socialist regime, they have tried to either destroy or attack religions in various ways. They need to whittle down and destroy moral values. They need to destroy the family unit. They need to destroy traditional values. They need to destroy traditional morality because only then can they dictate those things. And so what happens once those things are gone? Government action becomes the basis of morality. Whatever the party does is what is right. And that was what political correctness was. That's the origin of political correctness. Again, under Mao Zedong, this was around 1967. Now, notably as well, Mussolini had the same thing, where he said in his autobiography, called My Autobiography, very, uh, very, very well-spoken individual, right? Uh, where he said that under his fascist system, the individual would no longer have the antisocial choice to not follow the laws of the collective, essentially. It's the same exact thing. When the government is able to destroy religion and morality, it can replace that with its own system. And then government action becomes the basis of what is moral or immoral. And we should note that shortly after Joe Biden came into office in 2021, this was one of the very first things that started happening in the United States. This was an opinion piece at the time from The Hill, 2021, noting the impact that ESG policies were having when, it, when it, you know, even banks, for example, could cancel the services of individuals or companies if they were not following these woke moral standards or immoral standards, I would call them. The Hill said this in 2021, a disturbing trend has developed in which banks are declining to work with entire industries based on the desires of activists. Some of these industries that have been rejected by banks in recent years, it says include private prison operators, gun makers, they're trying to get rid of guns by just regulating and punishing the gun industry, and oil and gas companies. It says these decisions are all followed pressure from progressive campaigners, the woke madmen who are trying to influence government and try to control our lives from behind the scenes. It says, but if the trend continues, it could lead to discrimination of, or, and debanking of controversial, controversial only because the woke madmen dislike it, or disliked industries of all kinds. It says 
This is not in America's best interest, and this is why the government should adopt a proposed new regulation to stop it. Banks are creating a new version of redlining, this time against legal industries for political and ideological reasons and blaming it on vague risks to the bank's reputations. Again, folks, the bank cartel. The bank cartel is one of the most corrupt organizations on the face of the planet, tied in again with the Federal Reserve, in my opinion at least. Now, it's on this again. The threat of debanking against individuals. Because we talked a lot about going after big corporations, going after entire industries, but also individuals is one of the big parts of this. It's serious enough that in Iowa right now, the legislators are pushing a bill that would forbid banks from doing this. The Des Moines Register says, state senators have advanced a bill that, and it's still in process by the way, that would ban financial institutions from debanking or discriminating against people on the basis of their religious or conservative political beliefs. Advocates speaking on behalf of Iowa banks, credit unions, and businesses said a measure banning financial institutions from discriminating against people on the basis of their religious or conservative political beliefs was a solution in search of a problem that would hamper free markets. Now look, of course, a lot of this has so far focused on businesses. Businesses, banks, some government institutions, and you know, not so much on individuals, right? With the exception of some outspoken influencers and public figures like myself, who's been canceled and attacked in many ways. But already things are shifting in that direction, right towards the individual. In fact, in Washington state, lawmakers just passed a bill that would create a hotline where people can not only report hate crimes, because, you know, if you commit a hate crime, it's terrible, but also report so-called, quote, bias incidents. Not crimes, but incidents, and not hate, but bias. Now, Seattle Times says this. Washington, meaning Washington State, will establish a non-police hotline. It's a police outside of the police, apparently. And it says it will assist people who have been targeted by hate crimes and bias incidents. State lawmakers decided this week passing a new version of the bill that failed to advance last year. It says further that under Washington law, hate crimes are actions in which a perpetrator maliciously and intentionally causes physical injury or damage. In other words, you have to actually physically injure or damage something or someone for it to be a hate crime. And it has to be done because, again, an actual crime, injury, or damage to property because of an individual's race, color, religion, ancestry, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, gender expression or identity, or disability, which I'd say maybe is the same thing, right? It says, established as a category in Washington in 2019, hate crimes also include hate-related threats that cause an individual to reasonably fear harm. In other words, they expanded it to where it's not even you did something. You don't have to physically injure somebody. You don't have to physically destroy property. The individual can think that you are a threat to them. They can say that they're afraid of you and you can be charged with a hate crime because they fear that you will harm them because of who knows why. These are felony offenses punishable by up to five years in prison. And it goes beyond this because Again, not only have they expanded what constitutes a hate crime, that if someone has reasonable fear, you can go to prison for five years, right? It includes also this new one, SB 5427. And it says it defines bias incidents, not hate, but instead bias, and not a crime, but instead an incident, a bias incident, as, quote, hostile expressions of animus that relate to a victim's actual or perceived race, color, ethnicity, religion, ancestry, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, gender expression, or identity, or disability. It says that bias incidents don't include free speech expressions for or against the policies of foreign or domestic governments, the bill says. Now look, of course, under normal law, hate crimes are usually defined as actual crimes committed that would have a motivation of hatred behind them you actually have to violate a normal law. You actually have to hurt somebody and so on, right? 
We've now gone beyond that to the extent that you could be guilty of a similar crime even if you did no normal crime. You did not commit any crime. The individual who is probably deeply, some individuals who are deeply insane, let's say, who have, uh, are suffering from gender dysphoria, uh, are suicidal because of the poor choices in their lives, or other things like this. They're crazy, right? They can fear that you may harm them, and if they fear that you may harm them, you can go to prison based solely on their fear. But it's even beyond that. Even if there's no crime, even if you did nothing to the individual, if they just believe that you are biased against them, you could be charged with a crime. Now, I should note there's another level of concern to this, which is even, frankly, it stretches into moral and religious grounds. If you don't believe in the trans agenda, for example, you could face charges of a bias crime, since it includes so-called gender orientation or gender expression or whatever else. And there's also even the issue of these terms being overinterpreted in ways that may target people, frankly, just for engaging in free speech. And I would actually add to this, there's also circular logic to all of this. The irony is that it may be, in my opinion, religious discrimination to force somebody to acknowledge a practice or moral standard that may violate the standards of their religious beliefs. If you're a Christian or Muslim, you may not support the LGBTQ plus whatever movement. You may not believe in it. You may regard it as sodomy. You may regard it as a sin against God. And if that is your religion, who are they to say that you, that you can't say otherwise? Who are they to say that you cannot believe this, that your moral standards cannot encompass this? If someone is, for example, punished for opposing something that violates their religion, is this an issue of person discriminating against others? Or is it an issue of the religious believer being discriminated against by government law? I would say again, morality is not the realm of government. Government should not get involved in people's personal moral standards. And I would note too that frankly, the very basis of morality, if you have morals, it means that you believe that certain things are good practices and certain things are bad practices. If your moral standard suggests that you should maybe remain a virgin until marriage, that is your moral standard. And if you decide on that, it probably means you disagree with other people's choices in some instances. Who are they to punish you for disagreeing with other people's choices? It has skewed the very idea, I think, of what morality is. It's making it so that people, if you're not allowed to have standards, if you're not allowed to have personal ethics, if you're not allowed to believe that some things other people do are not good, uh, well, who are they to say that? Because what will happen eventually is this. If people are not allowed to say, I oppose that, if people are not allowed to discriminate to an extent, because discrimination is what the, it's the process you use, frankly, to discern what is desirable and what is undesirable, right? It's not always a bad thing. If they begin regulating that, the trend that will begin is that the only acceptable thing will be a complete abandonment of morality. The only acceptable moral standard will be zero morality, that you will have to accept everything. You will have to approve of everything. You will have to say that everything is good and nothing is bad. And what kind of a world would that create? One devoid of morality, one devoid of sexual chasteness, uh, one devoid of marriage uh, and traditional values attached to it, one devoid of many of the moral standards set down by religions. By doing this and by trying to regulate it, what government is doing is banning religious expression. They are banning the practice of morality that is the basis of most religions. And again, if they do that, I personally would say this should be deemed a violation of the Constitution. Because who are they to try to police morality? I don't agree with this. I think it's terrible. Um, Personally, my standard is this. I have moral standards I hold myself to. I do not believe other people have to hold my moral standards. I don't judge people. I don't look down on them. But I also don't like when they try to force their beliefs on me. I don't like when people try to say that I have to agree with what they do. I might not. It doesn't mean I hate them. It doesn't mean I dislike them. But as a moral person and a religious person, there are standards of morality I hold myself to, and I do that because I think this is the right way to do things. That is not hatred. 
that may be some form of discrimination, but not in a way de that is angry or unhappy with or looks down on others. I have my standards that I hold myself to and do not hold others to. Uh, but uh, frankly, if the government begins overstepping the boundaries of that and says that I am not allowed to have standards, I would say that that is an act of ironically discriminating against me. And I would say that by doing this, they're also discriminating against you. If they try to regulate what you can or can't believe in, what you can or can't think is right and wrong, uh, what you can or can't oppose, that I would say is a form of discrimination against the individual and against religion. Now look folks, a bit more on this. We can already see some real world examples of this happening. You could take for example what's being done, for example, against people who refuse to support the trans agenda. Fox News said this, a Washington state couple is suing the state because it denied them the opportunity to foster children due to their religious beliefs about gender identity. It says Alliance Defending Freedom, the ADF, filed a federal lawsuit on March 25th on behalf of Shane and Jennifer DeGrasse against Washington, Washington DC officials at the Washington State, or sorry, Washington State, at the Washington State Department of Children, Youth, and Families, DCYF, claiming the agency denied their application because they refused to use a foster child's inaccurate pronouns based on their perceived gender identity instead of their biological sex and required parents to take children to cultural events like pride parades. You have to, again, it's not just about Again, it's not just about you believing what you want to believe and you having standards and you having a religion. They want to force you to participate. They want to force you to do things that may violate your religion. They want to force you to go to their events and bow down before them and again, do things that may go against your understanding of traditional morality. That, in my opinion, is an act of discrimination in the truest sense. But it says further in, in August of 2022, the DeGrasses filed to renew their foster care license in Washington state after serving as foster parents for nearly nine years. But they were informed that new regulations in the state required all parents to adopt the government's ideology on gender and that failure to comply meant their application would be denied. It says, as Christians, the DeGrasses told the agency they would love and accept any child, but because of their Christian faith, they could not lie to a child and encourage them to reject their sex. And they say, quote, we got into foster care because as the Bible directs us to, to care for widows and orphans in their distress and keep oneself unstained from the world, uh, and keep oneself unstained from the world. It says that Shane DeGrasse told this to Fox News and added, there's a huge need in the state of Washington for foster families to come alongside these children in need. So we definitely felt compelled to take up that charge. But again, because they have religious beliefs that oppose these things, they are being forced to adhere to it. And if they refuse to adhere to it, they're being punished by the state. And so I would call all of this a war on religion. I would call all of this discrimination based on people's morals, uh, based on people's religious beliefs. I would call it violations in many regards of the First Amendment, our rights to free speech. I'd call it in many regards violations of the Second Amendment, people trying to restrict our ownership of firearms. Uh, personally, I think none of these things should be legal. This you know, DEI and ESG standards being adopted both by businesses and forced upon us and by governments and forced upon us. I don't believe that morality is the realm of the state, with the exception of what is traditionally violations of the law, such as stealing and murder and so on, right? They're trying to extend the nature of law into ways that may force people to violate their religions, and I would call that state interference with people's religious beliefs. Um, this is the trend now developing, and again, as we've been discussing, they even have scores and ways of measuring how deeply or how unwell you are adhering to these standards. And folks, that said, let's jump into some questions. So let's see here. And frankly, I will not comply. All right, let's see here. Uh, MR Plane, that's uh, MR Plane 12, you say, seems like a massive violation of privacy, talking about the ESG standards. 
which should only be, in, be typical in a tyrannical dictatorship, not in a free country. Well, I would remind people, and I'd fully agree with you, socialism is not only, or communism, is not only through government. If you go back to the original forms and debates around socialism, they had it enacted through a lot of different systems. Uh, there's, for example, syndicalism. Syndicalism would be socialism enforced through national unions, uh, which deeply ties in uh, with fascism under Mussolini, which also worked on similar concepts. There's technocracy, the enforcement of socialism through the advancement of technology managed by big businesses. Uh, there's, for example, other forms of it enacted, for example, through that, you know, the, using the Maoist method, where they try to get minority groups, groom them into becoming social activists or community organizers, and getting these people to create false labels to divide society and enact different forms of socialist policy, pushing for things that would eliminate the fake victimi victimhood uh, labels that they've manufactured. Um, a lot of the woke stuff we see around you know, the current wave of feminism, I would say maybe not the older ones, uh, that tie into, for example, a lot of the race, politics, and otherwise, these are Maoist agendas. These are, these are working through forms of Maoism. Um, I would say that in the West, we're actually facing almost every form of this in different regards. We're facing the woke unions, we're facing activist groups, we're facing businesses, uh, big corporations being controlled oftentimes by workers' unions, which are, again, practicing syndicalist-type behaviors. We see banking cartels, and keep in mind that centralized banking was something that even Karl Marx himself argued for, uh, the use of centralized banks. And the banking cartels are enacting different forms of social policies uh, because they control the money. And they've been given the ability to even make unsound business practices because they get bailed out through the Federal Reserve even if things go, go south. Uh, we pay for that through the, through the hidden tax of inflation, by the way. Uh, we see, for example, many forms of this, including radical organizations, lobbying, and even people getting into positions in government and trying to enact these policies through government. We see it being done through law enforcement, whereby attorneys general across the United States are being propped up by woke madmen, you know, billionaires like Soros, uh, who are backing these individuals and getting people in place who refuse to enforce normal law and instead decide to enforce law based on whatever twisted ideas they have about race politics and so on. We are facing multiple different angles of these same threats. And I would say that yes, we are living under a tyrannical communist dictatorship through other means, uh, being enforced by big business, unions, activist groups, and otherwise, which are trying in every single way to enact their policies not just through social pressures, where they try to cancel you or attack you or go after you, but even through law and through government, which they're trying desperately to gain hold of currently. I would say that the threats against us in this regard are coming from almost every direction. And I would deem all of this, yes, very accurately, a tyrannical dictatorship through other means. Kit Keller, you're saying, Josh, I'm currently reading the nine commentaries. I highly recommend it, by the way. Uh, Epic put out on communism slash CCP and its history. It's disturbing how many communist tactics discussed in the books are being used in America. I really hope more people can wake up to what's happening. Yeah, so briefly, the Epic Times many years ago, must have been around like 2006 or seven, around that time, uh, we published a set of nine commentaries in a book. It's called The Nine Commentaries on the Communist, on, on the Communist Party. Um, it was mainly a book against the CCP, and it detailed the history of the Chinese Communist Party, its evil ideology, how communism is a cult, like an evil religion, which it is. Uh, we described that in the book. Um, if you haven't read it yet, I can't recommend it enough. The Nine Commentaries also sparked in China what's called the Tweedong Movement, the Quit the Party Movement. And Chinese people, by the millions, in fact, I believe the number is last I checked was well over 400 million, have quit the Chinese Communist Party, the Youth League, or the Young Pioneers. The CCP is being dissolved from within through a moral awakening taking place in China, and that book helped spark that movement. I cannot recommend it enough. Again, 
Uh, you can read it for free on the Epic Times website. You can also buy the book. Again, it's called The Nine Commentaries. And Kit, I'd say, yeah, if you read it, you'll start seeing a lot of similarities. Because as many Chinese dissidents know, and as many people who've escaped the Chinese Communist Party understand, what the CCP did in order to establish itself and then, again, establish its dominance in China is it almost mirrors a lot of what we're watching happening in the United States and other parts of the world right now. The same tactics, the same demonizing of history, the same destruction of moral values, uh, the same attacks on religion, the same things the CCP did, you can watch them happening right now as we speak, right here in the United States, uh, by these organizations trying to enact very similar policies right here in the United States. And so I'd say that book is not only important to understanding the CCP, it's important to understand through the context of that the movements and organizations active in the United States trying to do the exact same thing and trying to turn the United States into communist China, frankly. Uh, it's a fantastic book. We also have another one, by the way, uh, called The Specter of Communism is Ruling Our World. And the Specter series, The Specter of Communism is Ruling Our World, describes more of the global communist system enacted in the West, tying in as well to China and so on. That's a very important book as well. I can't recommend it enough. If you haven't read it yet, be sure to read it. You can read it for free on the Epic Times website. You can also buy the book as well. It's called The Specter of Communism is Ruling Our World. Um, American woman, you're saying, do I get docked for reading slash watching only the Epic Times? Or am I considered responsible for not reading, uh, reading lies by the media? Hmm. Yeah. Um, Given, given the list of things that uh, they deem is uh, possibly labeling you, I, I'd hate to break it to all of you, but we're probably all on the naughty list. So, <laughs> hey, glad to have you all here. What can I say? You know, they, they, if there's enough of us, they can only do so much. Uh, frankly, I'd say actually that as crazy as this stuff sounds, it's failing. You know, look, for example, what happened to PayPal. As soon as they released that announcement, as soon as people saw what they did, people canceled them so hard that PayPal immediately backed off, threw its hands up and said, we didn't do that, or it was an error. It was an error. We didn't mean to say that. Yeah, it was an error they sent out through their official channels, right? Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, but regardless, you know, look at what happened with Bud Light. Look what happened to Target. As soon as people see what these companies and businesses and banks and financial institutions are, do institutions are doing, they oppose it so hard that the individuals aren't the ones who fold. The institutions are the ones who fold. Um, frankly, one of the things I've witnessed in this country over the last few years is the degree of, I'd say, moral solidarity of the American people. Despite the threats, despite the labeling, despite the propaganda and the lies from the big corporate media, despite the pressure from businesses and banks and woke organizations and crazy radicals like BLM and Antifa, despite all these groups trying to force you to adhere to their standards, I would say the overwhelming majority of people in this country have said, no, we will not comply, we will not do it. We don't believe in what you're doing, we think you're crazy. And um, I find that very encouraging, to be honest. I think the fact that people have not only rejected, frankly, what I would regard as evil, uh, these movements and groups and what they're doing. I would say it is metaphysically evil, frankly. Uh, what they're doing is evil, and I think the people standing up against it have shown a type of moral and religious solidarity against it, and even an ability of discernment, despite being bombarded with just constant lies and propaganda by the mainstream press. Um, I, it's encouraging, frankly. And I think that, uh, again, yeah, they probably do label us. <laughs> I mean, case in point, Crossroads, we're still like, we're on YouTube at least, but you know, we've been demonetized since 2021. The channel has been basically frozen on YouTube since 2021. Like, you know, we've been, I've been canceled, I've been attacked. Every time I do a documentary, they, they roll out new attacks against me, which, which I have a new one coming out soon, by the way. So stay tuned for updates on that. In a couple of weeks, hopefully, I'll keep, I'll keep you updated on it. We're gonna be going into what's really behind the border crisis. Um, speaking of getting attacked for speaking the truth. So <laughs> we'll see how that one goes. Uh, but coming soon, folks. I'll keep you updated. 
Uh, last question from California Galley saying, are these social scores a legal way of punishing Americans? Um, again, it's, it's questionable. Well, yeah, yes, first off, but I'd say it's questionably legal because what it is is businesses trying to enact policies that the government cannot enact. And I do think there's enough pushback, for example, by Congress, at least currently, that these things are getting exposed and businesses are actually having to answer for it. If you look, for example, at businesses backing off of ESG and backing off of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, if you look at investment firms having to back off this, and if you look at the attorneys general across the United States, even threatening criminal charges against some of these organizations because of it, um, I don't think it's going to hold up if it gets exposed. I, in fact, I think that if it gets exposed enough, it will crumble. Uh, we also find examples, though, of, for example, the Biden administration going through backdoor channels, uh, trying to work hand in glove with private businesses in order to enact these types of things. Uh, because, again, they can't legally do it. They can't legally enact these policies, but they can encourage private businesses to enact these policies. And congressional investigations, mainly through Republicans, into what they call the weaponization of government, has begun expanding or exposing those types of things. Um, I will say it again. I've said it many times, many times before. I don't believe evil can withstand the light of truth. And I believe that when truth is brought to the forefront, uh, that lies are naturally exposed. And frankly, evil has nowhere to hide. And I would say that these evil policies are deeply attacked as soon as people see them for what they are. And so, yeah, solution folks, always speak the truth. And uh, thank you for being here for that. All right, that's all for today. Uh, real quick, we have a promo for the Dark Origins of Communism series, which if you haven't watched yet, I highly recommend. I did a series of episodes, they're short, like, you know, they're short enough to watch in a pretty short sitting. Uh, but it's a series of them, and I explain the history of communist movements and delve into even some of the occult religious beliefs that helped form them. Communism is an evil religion, I will say. And if you understand its history, it's frankly very obvious, but a lot of that history is now forgotten. I have a series on this, again, The Dark Origins of Communism. You can find it on Epic TV. Uh, so for those of you on YouTube, Rumble, Twitter, Facebook, again, check it out. Also remember, we have a special sale right now for Easter, uh, which is going to be lasting until Thursday. You can get six months of a subscription for $1. Six months for $1, folks. So for $1, uh, you can get, of course, over to Epic TV and watch that series or the other documentaries I've done. And folks, thank you so much for being here. Uh, please help get the word out, share this episode. Tell a friend or family about Crossroads or, hey, spend a dollar and get them a subscription. Uh, but as always, thank you so much. Please take care of yourselves. And as always, stay informed and stay free. Thank you. In every country communism gains power, authoritarianism and death followed in its wake. Communism promises a world without suffering. And yet, in its execution, does the exact opposite. Following Lenin's death, Stalin's 29-year reign killed an estimated 60 to 66 million people. More famines and purges would occur. The very peasants that communism was supposed to benefit instead starved to death under its rule. The party dictates what is right and wrong. Mao ended up killing between 50 million and 70 million people. As an investigative journalist, I want to understand why.